weekend. Amen. I was going to have to ask something. Okay, um, good evening everyone. It is seven o'clock, uh, the Finance Committee meeting, April 11th, 2024. I am Tracy Osecki. Uh, I'm gonna chair this meeting. I'm asking us to go around and introduce ourselves starting to my left. Linda Stone, school board. Uh, Matt Adams, transportation. Matt Fredrickson, IT director. Ann Horner, school board. Tony Rapp, director of business administration. Michael Roosevelt, school board. Andy Sanko, superintendent. Bob Hickey, school board. Ed Tate, school board. Nicole Khan, school board. Yota Pali, school board. Okay, um, and Mr. Rapp, before I turn it over to you, uh, do you want, did you add something in here about the budget? I know that's gonna be- I didn't add something, but I was gonna talk okay, about Okay, so it. maybe I'll ask you to start with that, where okay. we are on that, because so, I know that's everybody's favorite topic. So just to give you a, an update on the budget, um, we're, working on the budget we're working on finishing the payroll numbers hope uh, we're trying to get them done by the end of this week or next week uh, the only thing i would have to present to you at this point would be the same thing i've already presented to you the preliminary numbers um i would like to ask if um uh, we would try to hold a special budget meeting later on this month um, and maybe even a second one uh, before the, before we start moving into May 9th. So um, I, I'll send out some dates to the board and we'll get it advertised and um, uh, or to the committee chairs and we'll get it advertised and, um, and uh, have those public meetings um, later on this month. Um, we should, we're, we're trying to put together a nice package for you to, for, to, to show and for you to see. So, um, uh, as soon as we're done with payroll, we're working on getting that together. All right. Good. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Osecki. Uh, Finance Committee meeting for April 11, 2024. Our agenda uh, an update on full day kindergarten. Uh, there'll be an update on Dur Durham, uh, uh, some things with, with Durham. Uh, I want to just, just show you what our grant activity, what grants we're working on right now. Um, review the MBIT 24-25 budget. I know I sent some information out about that, but I want to make sure that, you know, everybody understands why that went up a little bit. Um, uh, some s'mores licenses, that's... Uh, that's the a newsletter like license uh, newsletter software that we use. Uh, JAMF Pro license that is our. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll cover that when we get to it. The uh, Adlumen license uh, approved the graduation videography services RFP. I mean bids um, approved uh, a, a, a proposal for CR South uh, security. Uh, uh, approved uh, two two tutoring contracts and approve a CRF agreement for, for pianos, uh, they're half of the donation. So we'll start off with the full day, financing full day kindergarten update. Uh, this, a lot of these uh, uh, assumptions are this, these assumptions are the same as, as last time. Um, to begin in the 25-26 school year, uh, projected hiring of 17 new kindergarten teachers, that's just the teachers in the kindergarten classroom. Um, again, we are calculating an expenditure in 25-26 uh, for new teachers, 84,592. And again, these are all just assumptions right now. Um, our tax increase, uh, a 1% tax increase in next year, year's budget would be worth about 1,767,450. And a 1% increase in millage for the average uh, CRSD assessed value of 45,967 is $63. So, any increase in any, if you want to know what it would cost for an individual at that average, for our, our average assessed value at $63, you just have to multiply it by whatever tax percentage increase we talked about. So if we're talking about a 0.57 tax increase, you would just multiply $63 by that. And that would tell you, so if we're talking about a 1.15 tax increase, we just multiply 63 by 1.15. And that, that so you, we, you can use that to, to calculate what it would cost for the average uh, home in Council Rock. 
Uh, all assumptions are based on preliminary data and may change as more data becomes available. And right now, our current millage is 137.1566. Any questions on assumptions? How come we, we always assume how we're, we're, that we're going to hire teachers? Yes. How come we never put in no doubt assumption the other personnel that will be involved in all day kindergarten? Okay, um, we are not in a position yet. Like we're, we're doing this piecemeal, so we're working on, we, we calculated how many teachers we need now. <coughs> this update is about how many specials we need. Anything that we're doing now does not include special education, does not include aids. So we're, we're not factoring those in. So we're just showing you what 17 teachers and the uh, uh, going with uh, all, all specials for kindergarten would, would cost in, in, in additional teachers. Okay, because my concern I think will be when you show the next slide. Okay. Um, so uh, cost related, ex cost related to expanding kindergarten to five specials. Uh, we would say that that would require did some scheduling work with the scheduling people. Nicole did, and she, you know, put together that uh, we're assuming right now that it would add additional an additional seven special teachers. Um, uh, the total cost for the new special teachers then using that 84,522 in 25-26 would be 592,144, um, and we carried over from last month the assumed cost for kindergarten classroom teachers is 1,438,064. Uh, total assumed personnel cost for full day kindergarten in 25-26 is 2,030,208. Uh, that would, uh, according to the um, millage, 1% mill, millage increase uh, of 1,767,450, that would be 1.15% uh, 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 increase. Uh, again, I talked, I talked last month about splitting this into two years uh, so that we don't have the big effect on the taxpayer for full day kindergarten in one year. So if we split that in the first year, uh, that would be a 0.57 millage increase in 24-25, and that would be uh, $63. $63 times 0.57 would be the average millage increase in the district next year. Um, 0.57 times 63. Uh, and the, ne the next year's millage would be, we would need less of an increase because of the multiplicative effect of tax increases plus um, other things like uh, assessment, increased assessment values as, as, as those go up. Can I interrupt for a second, Tony? I just want to make sure I understand that correctly. So um, what I'm calculating here is a millage increase for 1.15 is $72.45 per household, and that would be divided by two, essentially. No. That's the first year. That's the first year. So it would be 72 the first year. Less than last year this. because okay, we're me. because we're increasing taxes, so we would need to increase taxes for next year's twenty five twenty six is increased yep. by less than that point five seven. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide? Is it worth um, asking about facility costs at this point? We heard previously that we needed 16 or 17 extra classrooms. Um, we're still working on that. Okay. We're working with the building principal to determine um, where we have enough space. And um, I don't I don't have a definitive answer on that. I, I would say it, 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 it looks, you know, we're, we're working on it. Right? And so the 1% talking about is for the two million that we're talking about is just the soft costs just for personnel increases and that's going to require a one percent tax increase split over two years well, one point one five one point one five one point one five split over two years so point five seven point five seven five really so if like this was being done last year hypothetically we had roughly a two percent just rounded for simplicity that would mean we're talking about 
2.57 yes. this year, and then if that helped, it would be another 2.57 the next year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hickey? Right, but, it, but also keep in mind, even though we're splitting it over two years, that that tax gets carried, as much like you say before, with we, whatever we tax gets carried over from year to year. So right. it does carry over till the next year, and then it carries over in perpetuity, as it were, you know, because it's always going to be there. Um, this will sound odd, I guess, but because what about, and I guess maybe we haven't talked about this yet, uh, as I look at the tax, from a taxpayer point of view, is every year we end up having a surplus. Yes. You know, is there any thought or anything going into the possibility of trying to fund this through our surplus or? So going back to how we budget, and we budget conservatively, and um, it's very hard to know what our final, especially from this state, what our final numbers are going to be. But all of it is, you know, you know, we, 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 we use our formulas to, to come up with the best guess. Um, and then some expenses don't get made. But the district does rely on that surplus to fund our summer projects, our future construction, smaller construction projects. And when we get those surpluses to transfer them to capital, like right now we have a healthy balance in our capital reserve account. Um, we have maybe two more years before that balance isn't so healthy. If we, we also got to have, we also should have money set aside, not I don't say set aside, but we should also have money available um, for if we had a major problem. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I would be low, I would, I would recommend against, sure. against using that surplus for, for full day dinner. I would like to keep moving it to um, capital reserve when we have a surplus. Right. Because the other thing is, we do budget conservatively, but there could come a year where we don't, where we don't end up with a surplus, and we end up, um, you know. And we we've been budgeting for the last for for, for several years. We've been budgeting a um, uh, a, a use of fund balance. So um, you know, if that comes true, you, we don't want to you know, we it wouldn't be available for. Any, any, anything like this. Yeah. And I guess the concern I have, like as I've said before, is that the majority of the people who live in this district don't necessarily have children in the school, and even a lesser percentage of those people have children in kindergarten. So we're basically footing the bill for you know a relatively small amount of people. And the other concern I have as we go through this timeline, although we haven't discussed it, you know, in June we have to vote for a budget and we may or I'm assuming that we may not have, have enough information to vote on all day kindergarten. However, we may be saying to the average taxpayer that we're going to increase your taxes an extra 5.57% because we think we're going to do it. Which I know that's not your, you know, but as we go through, you know, my concern is that we might vote on a budget with a tax increase and we still haven't even decided whether or not full day kindergarten is a viable option for the district. Mr. Tate? I was thinking about that earlier this evening. Um, and, you know, you read the tea leaves, it seems like the board's undecided on a full day kindergarten, but there's a fair amount of support. So it's likely that the board could vote in favor of full day kindergarten or surprise, we might vote against it. And the tax increase that, that um, the administration has proposed um, might go into effect before we have made a final decision on full day kindergarten. If that were the case, that would factor into our budget deliberations the following year. And we, we might have implemented a small tax increase for full day kindergarten that doesn't end up being spent on full day kindergarten, 
it would go into our general operating fund and we would spend it just as wisely as if it were to go to full day kindergarten. So yeah, um, I, I can see that possibility. I don't see it as, as a problem. I also look at it, we're better off being prepared than having to slam people the following year if we do decide to move forward, um, which was a great idea that Tony had with splitting the, that expense over uh, two years. So I would also draw attention to one of the other reasons that I'm recommending <coughs> is the Act 1 index is 5.3% this year which is a lot of room for us. Uh, next year, it's predicted to go down. And I don't know what, obviously, I don't know at this point what taxing we might need to, to make our budget reasonable next year. So uh, that percentage from year to year, I, you know, I'm not saying just to, to, to use the percentage this year because we have it, but, but you know, we talked about different things last week. Um, we talked about our position with debt service and those types of things where um, if we have, um, I, I have concern that in the future, we're going to need a tax increase that we're not going to be able to, to, to ask for because, because we kept them low in years when we were allowed to go higher and kept them, uh, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just bringing this to your attention, um, that, that, that these things, that this is a possibility that at some point we may need uh, for, for building, for what for whatever reason, we may need a higher tax increase than we're we're, we're getting. So, I, I, and I'm going to make that point again during the budget meetings that um, that that this is this is probably the highest that one, at least according to what the state is saying right now, that this is probably the highest Act One index we're going to see. Um, so, Mr. I have one more question. Um, we have. I think we were calling it an educational improvement fund. Yes. Of eight million dollars. It's a little under that now because we use some. We use we're using some money at the beginning of the year with eight million dollars. We're using some of that money for smart boards and some of the elementary in right. in elementary schools. Okay. Right, so. um, uh, of the upfront startup costs for full day kindergarten, what? is going to be funded from the educational improvement fund um i would you know any any purchases of textbooks that we need to buy <coughs> um, we talked about having a business with these in the in the kindergarten room right. that the rooms that are not currently kindergarten room are going to become them um you, know, you have a decision to make on what we're going to do with bathrooms some of that we can use for that if it starts getting higher, I would prefer to go to Capital Reserve um, to, to, to fund that, but but that's that's down the road, but but I would say anything that's not related to salary, uh, unless we get into large costs related to installing bathrooms. Great, that's what I thought, thank you. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, go ahead, thank you. Uh, Durham update. So uh, we we met. We've been meeting with Durham administration, um, discussing the issues they're, they're they've come up with um, different things that they're going to present <laughs> at ne at next week's board meeting that they're that they're currently doing. Um, there's a presentation that they're they're going to do on that. But we've been working with them on on some of the other things um, related to costs and uh, we kind of. Brought this up as as part of uh, you know Matt's been working on this, uh, we'll be working on, on on changing some of the contract terms a little bit. So uh, one of the things that that was costing us some money was um, the uh, if, if if we had a a short trip, the contract said that if, if we had a, a short time span trip, um, say they were going they they had to transport kids from the middle school to the high school and it took an hour or took two hours we had a minimum number of hours that they could charge us of five hours so if, if, if we if, if we did a trip for five out for for six hours or for, for two hours we would get charged for five hours um, 
they uh, they agreed uh, at the beginning of this school year um, to change that minimum from five to two, and two is probably is it, I think this is right. Two is probably the minimum we're going to have for any run. You know, between the time of them getting somebody on the bus, getting the bus prepared, and driving out, it's going to cost them two hours worth of driver time. So. So we're not at a point where we're getting charged anything extra anymore for, for these short runs, okay? <coughs> uh, the next thing is uh, we talked about um, putting in cameras at both depots in, in for the exterior of the building, you know, to see what's going on with, with, with the buses and drivers and staff coming in. Um, they have agreed to uh, fund the fiber optics for these cameras at both depots for the remainder of the contract. So. The, the, they will. They have agreed to pay the full cost of the fiber at both, which is you know a pretty. I think it starts at like thirty-five thousand, and it's like five percent increase every year <coughs> for the, the remainder of the contract. Um, uh, a big one, the, probably the biggest one on here. They have agreed to reduce the contracted increase over the remainder of the contract from four and a half percent to four percent. So the contract, as it was, called for a four and a half percent increase every year. They've agreed to reduce that rate to four and a half, to four um, percent. They have already implemented that for 23, 24. So we were already only paying based upon a four percent increase. Um, we had gotten them to agree to that before, but now they're they they now agreed to do that for the full year. So so that that re reduces our increase. And um, as I said before, they're to present at the April 18th board meeting. So the uh, half percent decrease, what does it mean in, in, in dollars? From the time it's implemented to the end of the contract, it's about $2 million. Well, with that and the, and the, the hours, it's about $2 million total. So on an annual basis? No. No, do you Throughout the life of the contract. Yeah. So the life of the contract. Yeah, but on like year to year, so is it the first year like maybe Three hundred thousand, something like that. Yes, three hundred, and it, you know it's more in the second year because of because there's less of a percentage going on. But um, four percent seems to be a reasonable amount in the industry. Looking at other contracts, um, I think four and a half of the high, but they've agreed to reduce it to that. Congratulations! I think that's fantastic that you were able to negotiate that. Two million is a lot of money. Ah, that could pay for kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> Pay for the teacher. Yeah, Ms. Khan? Actually, Ms. Uh, Polly answered the question, or yeah. asked the questions and it was answered. Thank you. Okay, I have a question before doing questions now. Um, uh, so I'm thrilled to hear that they're giving us some financial benefit. Um, we obviously have a major safety concern. It, are they going to address that at the April 18th meeting yes, as well? Yes, the majority the is there. That they're going to address It's going to be based on, on safety concerns. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm just covering the, the, financial. the financial portion of what they've agreed to. Okay. Anybody else? Is this, is this would this be the end of Durham? Or do you have another slide for Durham? I believe this is the end, yeah, this is the end of Durham. Okay. And then the questions for Mr. Adams. Um, <clears throat> has Durham missed any routes? Have there any been any driver shortages where they're scrambling to try to get drivers? Um, this was this gave this district significant strain a couple of years ago. Are we through all of that? There was a little bit last year, but are we through yeah, that now? There was a little bit last year. Um, this year we're, we're stabilized. Um, you know, there's there's still days where, you know, a little bit of juggling is, is required for, you know, a number of reasons, but uh, we're, we're not at the point where we're just saying we, we just don't have enough drivers to run the routes. So we're, we're covering everything every day, and we still have some routes that we that we have we are paying a third party another party. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, but they're but the routes that they were able to take on, we're not having right, right, like yeah. But we do it like a lot of our yeah, can you a lot of our um, private school runs are, yeah. are done by a third party. Yeah, like we have a fourth sense. party. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll use smaller carriers. For <laughs> routes uh, that will that will be taking one student from you know our district to a school in Philadelphia. That doesn't you know it, it just makes more sense to use 
a, a third party vendor than to send you know a bus and a driver that could transport you know 15 kids 20 kids to and from school rather than send that bus and driver down to philadelphia for a route that's you know, going to take two and a half three hours and there are occasional double backs i mean i know that mm -hmm. because yeah. mm -hmm. I, that's happened to my kid but yeah yeah it seems rare yeah it's it's rare um, it, it's rare to the point that I'm actually tracking that now instead of you know what what routes were missed. So you know overall service has been much much better this year, kind of back to you know pre-pandemic levels. I would say. Miss Stone, I have two questions, and one is, do we also examine the safety? protocols of these third vendors yes yes they're they're held to exactly the same standard and in some cases uh, slightly higher than Durham or our, our own district employees they have all the same clearances all the same uh, all the same uh, safety requirements and background checks uh, are they're all uh, exactly the same as as what we see from uh, during drivers or, or our own van drivers. Okay. And my second question was, was there any um, update on the fire, that bus fire? Uh, and it's under investigation. I think it's still so they, under, it's still it, Yeah, they're, they're still looking at it. Um, the, I think we should, we'll probably should hear something relatively soon uh, from the fire marshal. Uh, that's, that's leading the investigation. Would we hear directly from the fire marshal or will it go through Durham? Um, um, I, I mean, it, it is Durham's bus, so yeah. I, would, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. So. so if they find something out, they may address it at the we'll, we'll be able to find next it. week's meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a decent relationship with the fire marshal in, uh, in Wrightstown. Mm -hmm. um, and have been talking to them back and forth about this specific event. So, um, whatever whatever they find, uh, we'll also get the report on it, so that you know it's a, a second set of eyes, and then you know additional oversight. <coughs> you know, there was something you know systemic or manufacturing related to to the bus. Thank you, Ms. Khan. So there's five years left of the seven-year contract with Durham, is that correct? Uh, this is year two, I think. Yeah, we're in year two. Okay. Um, and then I know as part of the original con contract, there were a number of new buses that were going to be added to the fleet. I know mm -hmm. we got several. Mm -hmm. have, we, have they fulfilled the contract in its entirety at this point, or are there still things missing? So we're still um, awaiting the... Um, the last handful of the, the half size buses, those for whatever reason take longer to manufacture and deliver. Um, but we have 26, I believe, out of 30 total that are coming in uh, are on site and in varying stages of being prepped for, for implementation. I think uh, the, typically the last stage of that is inspection by the, the state troopers. Um, so there's uh, there, there's still a handful left to come in at four or five that aren't on site yet, but the other uh, 26 are are there, and they'll be swapped in in a much less dramatic fashion than than the full size buses. Because they can be swapped in one for one, okay. and that's the half half size. Those buses, are the half right? size buses. Yes. And but in regards to the full size buses, we're all full size buses are all propane now. Uh, I believe there's we have two diesel buses left that are uh, held in like deep reserve if they're needed for for substitutions. But that that's it. Mr. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sir, I can wait. If anyone or uh, Mr. Hickey had his hand up, but he's going to go. Yeah, not, not that I really 
care about what other districts do. I care about what our district does. But we do send out a lot of comparative data as it relates to other subjects on how we're doing as it relates to other things. Do you keep in contact with any of the other transportation managers throughout Bucks County or whatever to see how we're faring as compared to others? Like, for example, I ride down up Alms House Road and right off of York Road outside Warwick Elementary, there's a big sign looking for bus drivers. I'm just curious as to how other districts are managing through this because, uh, like you said, two years ago before we got Durham, I mean, this was an everyday item of all year long. And other than the hiccup at the beginning of what I consider, I haven't heard any of it. You know, what I hear now is the anomaly. What is what I would say more or less routine? Not that I want to see any bus late or missed. But it seems to be more or less routine. I just wonder how we're faring as compared to some of the other districts based on what we did and who we hired and what we're paying. We're in significantly better shape driver-wise and route coverage-wise. Um, on the whole, we're covering all of our routes every day. Um, you know, there there's some leads here and there, you know, some some double backs we'll see those uh, occasionally um, but that no, is due to things like call out which right, right that's that's that's, that's, that's the normal course of business in my right yeah. yeah and I would say the majority of the districts around us they may be covering all of their routes every day but there's a lot more double backs. Uh, there's a lot of a lot more you know route combinations. Uh, just last week, I think there was uh, supposed to be. I think Collin Middle was uh, playing a home game that they uh, against. I think it was Centennial, and and Centennial couldn't you know couldn't make it because they couldn't get their players there. Um, so we, we don't have anything like that going on. Thank you. Mr. Roosevelt. Thank you. Just a follow-up question, um, which I think weaves together both items A and B. Um, as far as transportation goes for full-day kindergarten, have we evaluated, I think there was an estimation of yeah. $500,000 maybe savings because we don't have a midday route. Yes. But does that mean that we are confident that the remaining buses in both the morning and the, and the, and the afternoon, or the late afternoon, have space for all of the new kindergarten kids? So the kindergarten kids are going to be riding the bus with the elementary kids and the routes are consistent so that you don't need to add routes to accommodate full day kindergarten. So what, what I looked at was how much space was on the average bus at a given school. And just based on the, you know, the percentage of enrollment taking, you know, what we thought enrollment was easy, and then using the percentages to, you know, look at how many kids would be added at each school in the morning and afternoon against how much space was available on the average bus for that school and figured that it would we would have to add some routes to to have available space but the number of routes we would add would cost on an annual basis less than what we would save by not having those midday routes. And so if this district chose to go to full day kindergarten, that completely eliminates the need of, per se, a parent that wanted half day kindergarten, because there'd be no bus routes. They're effectively forced into having their kid in full day kindergarten. Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, this is something that the parents need to understand. So there wouldn't be any midday routes. There wouldn't be any half day kindergarten. And I don't think so. Yeah, I mean that that, that the assumption is that there were no midday routes at all. Yeah. Okay. I mean that's but that's I, that would be our assumption now. I mean Okay. And and then 
um, finally, has Durham looked and studied any of this data, and do they concur, especially considering how they're they're waiving, uh, you know, they're reducing that 4.5 to 4 percent moving forward in the contract year? Have are they aware that this district may include full day kindergarten? Yeah, they they're definitely aware. Uh, I've had several conversations with you know, the local representation. I know in meetings with uh, you know, the higher up the, the food chain there with Tony, they're aware that that's coming. They're aware that that would mean a reduction of or elimination of midday routes, essentially, um, and that whatever the added AM you know, morning and afternoon bus would be as a result isn't isn't going to balance out. Thank you. Okay. Oh wait, sorry. Oh, okay. go ahead. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Um, I guess just kind of circling back in terms of we're talking about safety. Um, I know that this issue of still buses that are stopped um, with cars passing by on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. I know it still happens. Um, and we've talked to Jerome in the past about their cameras, but their G-Force camera that wouldn't trigger something like that. Yeah. But I know those cameras exist because they exist in other school districts mm -hmm. or other bus companies. Why is it that Durham never, I mean, that's a huge safety. So a lot of, you know, so that, from, from what I understand, that's, that's a, a, a different system that those yeah. school districts are purchasing. Um, and um, so it, it's, it's not something that, that, that Durham is currently equipped to do. That would probably be more of a school, or it, it would be, it's, it's a different system in that there's, there's, the way that system works at the other school districts is the companies install the cameras, and then the people that get fined are you are you used to pay the company? So that money, so the portion that's supposed to go to the school district goes to the company. Oh, okay, for the for the maintenance or <clears throat> guest use of the cameras. Yeah, for the for the use of the camera. Yeah, so that's how those companies make money. I don't know that. Matt Matt presented on. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Two years ago or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, the, that company's called. Bus patrol, they're they're out there. Um, they rely on writing a lot of tickets, so they kind of you know anything that could be construed as a as a violation will be thrown against the wall and see what sticks. Kind of approach, hoping that people just pay it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those tickets, though, if they challenge them in traffic court. Uh, they 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 lose, so they end up not paying the fine. Um, Who loses? The like the whoever the, the driver, the driver, the driver okay. of the car, or right. so the you know if they challenge it in traffic court, the the driver typically wins those. Oh, okay. um, because the the whole you know, the whole concentration of it is to write as many tickets as humanly possible. <laughs> And that's that's how they make money. They they take a percentage of what comes in up to the amount that covers the camera. They take a hundred percent of that until it covers the equipment and licensing, and then anything above that, they take like sixty or sixty or seventy percent of it. And then the, the district gets what's left over, but it typically doesn't really get to that point. So it's not really like a they bill it as a revenue generation type of system, but it's it doesn't really work that way unless you know it works that way in extremely large school districts that have a lot of you know densely packed neighborhoods. Um, a lot more traffic around the vehicles, um, so it, it's kind of a system that you can get that's not really going to live up to what it's billed as, and it ends up kind of being a nuisance for the, the people.
people that live in the community because they're just getting tickets. So there's just really no solution. Are you saying there's really no it's, solution to this? It's because having you know, I was told to get my camera out. And I was like, well, how am I going to get my camera out? I'm at the bus stop. I'm not looking yeah. to for the so, driver. So neither is the bus driver that's driving the bus. Right. So what we do currently is there's areas where it's more prevalent than others. Um, there's typically they'll be closer to the bypass where you know, the cars are on like 55, 60, and then they get on the state street and feel like they still want to go 60. So you know, you'll see them there. Um, and the drivers do, they report incidents of cars running their lights, and then we work with the local police department to get cars stationed near those locations so that they're there as a deterrent first and then <coughs> to write the ticket if, if needed. We construct, and if I'm wrong, most of our routes are constructed that the pickup is on the... Right. They, right. They're not crossing this. As much as possible, they're not crossing Yeah, so larger roads is, is where this happens, and we design the routes to the curbside for this for this reason. It's a, it's a safety thing, so that you know the kids aren't crossing the street, where you know somebody that's in a huge hurry and decides they're going to pass the bus isn't you know they're not in a situation where they're walking in front of that car. Stop. No, I'm fine. Okay. Anybody else? Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. The next item, I just want to go over uh, the the various grants that we're working on right now in the district um, uh, in various stages of application. Um, one is a multi-purpose community facilities program. It's using some uh, COVID-19 money. Uh, there are it's through the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. It's due on the 20th of this month. We're working on it right now. Um, it's uh, awarding uh, $250,000 to $2 million per, per grant application. It is a competitive grant. Um, it's basically to uh, uh, work on buildings that are open to the public. Um, so, And they would consider a school building as open to the public if they're going in and out of there. Um, it can community anchor institutions, uh, the construct improved facilities, uh, where I believe we're, we're applying to, uh, for one of our uh, school roof replacement projects to try to get uh, a, a bunch out of that as, as we can. Um, so we'll, we'll have that application in this month and hopefully we'll get something there. Uh, another one is the uh, public school facility improvement grant. This is through again through the Pennsylvania Department of uh, Com Community and Economic Development. It's um, also through the uh, Commonwealth Financing Authority, which is uh, uh, affiliated with the uh, DCED. Um, its uh, application date is five twenty one twenty four. This one uh, grants a range between fifty fifty thousand and five million. Um, and they're basically for buildings, um, uh, school buildings, um, but school buildings where there are students. So um, if the grant paperwork specifically excludes administrative buildings. Um, we are looking at, and, and part of the issue with this grant is you have to have your project bid out. The first grant, you can be working on the project. The, sec the second grant now, you have to have your project bid out. So we can only apply for reimbursement on grant projects that are um, that are or we already have we already have contracts signed. Um, so we're I think and you're allowed to apply for more than one. So we're going to try. We don't have anything that's five million, but we're going to try to apply for several to try to get get some money back to that and maximize that as much as we can for projects that we've already have open. Um, and again, that's due next month. Uh, we also have the uh, uh, P2023-24 School Safety and Security Meritorious Grant. This is non-competitive. It's through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. We've already filed for this grant, uh, 45,000. Um, and this is uh, for programs that address physical and safety and security. I'm not going to go into specifics of that because it's related to security and safety. 
um, another competitive school grant through the PCCD, uh, and that's to make, uh, again, to make school entities safer places. We have applied for $450,000. And then um, the uh, 23-24 school mental health grant uh, to, to provide, and we've also applied for that for $226,882 uh, to provide eligible schools to support mental health initiatives. So those are the grants that we're applying for right now. I did receive today about, we did receive today uh, about $640,000 from what's called the ACE grant for the Richboro project, which is uh, uh, the, the uh, basically like a, because we're doing things that are in that building that are considered, uh, you know, hot, uh, energy savings related to energy savings. So we got, we got, we received the six hundred and thirty, I think it was thirty-four thousand dollar grant today. Uh, we received the, actually received the money today. We at first didn't know what it was. For. <laughs> <laughs> so, could have taken everyone to lunch. <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to see us applying for all these grants, and I appreciate the update and that you guys are keeping your eyes peeled for all these. Um, I know we have a couple questions, but before that, I was hoping that for the public uh, listening or watching at home, that you could just again reiterate about the difference between competitive and non-competitive, just so that everybody's very clear. And then I'll go to questions. I'm going to defer to my friend Andrew for that. So competitive grant is just what it says. I mean, you are competing for funds, so you have to make your case, and uh, especially with these organizations because they're state run. So there are a lot of school districts out there who are trying to make the case that the money would be best for us here. One thing that we have in competitive grants that really doesn't help us a lot is our zip code. It's our demographics, the, the income level. They sometimes, especially with PCCD, they look for um, many of their grants look for high crime areas, uh, high incidence areas. So we're you know, precluded from applying for them. But these grants, and they're really supportive when you apply for the grant. Uh, for example, with the PCCD grants that we have up there, um, we know they're working through the system because they will send an email saying, you know, this line and that line don't add. Can you fix it and they get back to us? So um, we should be hearing from them shortly about those grants. So the non-competitive means that you have an equal chance, you really don't need to make your case, is that they will judge your project on its merits, not so much the demographic context that the school is in. Okay, so none of these are, at this point, uh, do we know that we're getting for sure? Yes. Yeah, just so that the public is clear. Okay. Um, Ms. Stone, I know uh, there were a couple of hands. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask the same thing to explain okay. the competitive and non-competitive. And then also I noticed today um, someone talked about uh, about a multimodal transportation grant, if anyone had seen that. I don't know what it relates to. Multimodal. Um, if that's, if multimodal it, transportation fund. So student oh, the what? I don't know what it's related to. It's From the uh, Community of Economic Development, DCED. So can I read that to you real quick? Sure. Funds may be used for the development, rehabilitation, and enhancement of transportation assets to existing communities, streetscape, lighting, sidewalk enhancement, pedestrian safety, connectivity of transportation assets, and transit-oriented development is not eligible for schools. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, Andrea um, keeps us up to date on all the grants that are out there. She's really looking for them. So. Does a great job with that. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? I saw a couple hands. I thought that was the question. Everybody had the same one. Okay. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda <clears throat> is the MBIT budget. Um, so, if you look at the the budget, you can see that our budget um, for next year they're asking for one thousand seven hundred ninety-four thousand one hundred forty-two dollars in in tuition. Um, 468,509 in our share of the lease rental, which is basically their, their debt payment. So, so they, they've taken out debt to build, to improve their buildings. And we, we have, uh, we have a share that we pay on that. Um, that, that's the total of, of funds related to 24, 25, of 2,262,651. 
Um, you can compare that to the current year, uh, 1,617,023, and then 468. So our, our tuition has gone up by 177,119. Our lease rental debt is basically the same. Um, so the total increase is 177,268, um, which is an 8.5% increase. Now, all the, all the amounts that we pay, that we're paying in the current year and that we're planning to pay next year are, um, are estimates based on the number of students that we have. So because of that, uh, the year after the year end, so, so in, in this current year, they look at the, as we budget for 24-25, they look at the 21-20, um, the, uh, so this year they looked at the 21-22 budget and uh, added, added that. So, so they, they look at what we paid versus what we should have paid based on our full enrollment for that year. Um, so in, in the current, in the next year's budget then, they give us that difference. So uh, what we should have paid based on in 21, uh, in 22-23 last year uh, was $285,614 less than, or more than what we actually paid based on the, the budget going into that year. Um, so, but in the prior year, when we looked at the 21-22 budget, they did that comparison, we only underpaid by 3,612. So that went up by $282,002, which was an increase of 7,807%. Um, yeah, that's a fun number to say. Uh, <laughs> So if you look at the total budget for next year, it's 2,548,265. And then the budget for this year is 2,088,995. So that's a dollar change of 459,270, which is um, almost 22%. You can see that the reconciliations are two fiscal years behind. Um, now to talk about why we are having such a, good, such a, a, a decent increase, um, if we look at the average daily membership of CRSD students at MBIT, in 21-22, we had 134.41. In 22-23, we had 138.44. In 23-24, And in 24-25, 171. So we are definitely, we've definitely increased our membership in the, in the program over the last two years, which, you know, I think that's a, it's a good thing. And, um, you can see that the cost per student that they charge according to the budget has been going has actually been decreasing every year. And um, Council Rock is actually have has a larger percentage of growth in this area than than the other schools that are involved. So so it's reaching the kids in our district, and and we've seen you know how well they've been doing with this program. So you know I think this is great for the kids uh, that are there, the students that are going there. So. Um, if you look at 24-25 and 23-24, we've gone up 17.07 students. Um, uh, you know, what we're projected to go to last year based on, and that's based on an average of the last three years. So it's probably gonna be even more than that. So it's like they take, they take the June, th th that number is based on um, the October enrollment for 23, and then the enrollment at 630, 23 and 630 22 it's an average of those three numbers and that's what they use to project next year so um uh, uh so the actual increase is slightly lower due to the cost being lower so the cost went from 499 10,499 to 10,487 the increase the cost per the total cost per student increase is 179.13 but the actual increase was only 177 because the cost per student went down um, and then you can see that um, what we pay to educate students in um, in, in Council Rock is um, uh, fifteen thousand eight ninety seven for regular education and forty six thousand five fifteen for special education. So, so I think. So, I wanted to ask you how you estimate the seventeen students increase. And you said that they look at the enrollment. Sorry. The enrollment over the last three years. Yes, yes. And if you look at the increase in enrollment, the actual, it's uh, the average is not is less than seventeen. 
Yeah. So how did you come up with, isn't that maybe too high, the 17, if you look at the average of the last three? It's like, what, like four in one year? That, that, those are the budgeted numbers. Those are not the, um, th those are the budget averages. So that's not the average. That's, that's, the, the, that, that's what was calculated last year based on the average. So those are averages of the other years. So these are not the actual students? They are. The, so in 20... So students coming. Or do we have 154 students or it's, it's different than that? Um, I, I, I know about this year. Right now we have 180 students. So it's much more than 154. Yeah. So 154 is a budget number. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's based on an average of right. those numbers for three years, and those are the, so none of these numbers are actual. They're all averages of different times. So, like the, the 134 is gonna count towards, um, actually the 134 is gonna count towards all, towards, uh, Course of the year, but there's there's other numbers going into that, so it's not it's not like like you can't calculate an average from from what's up here. The average is based on, and and we have we we you know we the, the, this is reconciled through the state, so these numbers are, are accurate for where we're at. Yep. If I look at the census sheet, I believe it was 108 yeah, okay. or 100. What does he show? Like, like, like you vary between 171 and 180 this year. But you can't look at. But the other problem is you can't look at the census sheet and tell that because if we have a student that's in Achieve and in and in BIT, they're not counted on the census sheet because they can't count the student twice. So if, if if it says that we've got 171 students in MBIT and we've got just for an example, take 41 students in Achieve. Ten of those students could be MBIT students, but they don't get counted in MBIT on our census sheet. Um, but they do get count a census our enrollment sheet. They don't get counted for that because they can't be counted twice. If that makes sense. So the so, seventeen I, 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 is it what we are actually expect to see an increase, or it's just the average again of like a, the budgeting? That's the but that's what their that's budget. The that's the number that they're using to budget the increase. That's confusing between oh. the actual. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent a lot of time looking into this to try to make sure that I had this right. And right. there's a lot of a, lo a lot of like, and, then, and that's how I found out that that the numbers. Like I was looking at our census sheet and I was seeing their census sheet, and I'm like, your number's higher than what's on our census. And then I found out our census sheet does not our enrollment sheet. I'm sorry, I used to. But our enrollment sheet does not count, um, does not count uh, achieve, achieve students who are both in MBIT and Achieve. Um, so there's, there, there's a lot of, uh, of calculations that go, that go into this. And, and it's all, but, but the thing that gave me comfort was the fact that it's all verified by the state. So we're reporting our students, the state then checks that against what the MBIT is reporting, and the numbers come back. As matching, so I, you know we're we're it's it's, it's our, as accurate as it our can MBIT be. reps feel comfortable about this budget because you I'm sure you review that with within. The I mean, when I saw that, you know, I was stunned because you know we come to you guys and oh we're looking at this, we're looking at that. You know, I think I was telling you before a couple of months ago we're you know we're looking at like a four percent increase, not knowing that. This is how this number is calculated, and our enrollment has increased. And if you look at the increase in enrollment and time to buy the cost of the school, you know it, it makes up for some of that difference. But I guess, and, and I'll ask a question: Why do we do a three-year average as opposed to any idea as to why we do a three-year average as opposed to the actual amount of students that we have? Because it can change. It can change pretty drastically from beginning of the school year to the end of the school year. Yeah, I mean, I guess it could change drastically. I mean, because the question I have is, we underestimated our numbers so poorly that it has now come back to have almost a quarter of a million dollar increase on top of the surprise last year, which A, doesn't make me happy, and B, as the representative, makes me look a little 
You know, how, how come I'm not aware? You know, uh, so I have a lot of different feelings about this. I, you know, one of which is I have a responsibility to the other board members here and, and doesn't count. She's been sitting on the board for two months as opposed to two years. And uh, I really, I'm not happy with the fact that I was giving misinformation out to the board. And this is now two years in a row. I think you were giving misinformation. It's based on their best assumption of, mm. and I, I, I would tell you that money that we don't have to pay in for two years is found money. If you think about it, because, <laughs> yeah. no, because we're holding that two hundred thousand dollars for two years. That's in our investment pool, in our investments, and we're making more interest off that than if it's sitting in. Even when it buzzes, otherwise it's no secret. Right. I would. I. I mean, me personally, I would correct. I would prefer to have a, a more accurate accounting as a you know as I said because I'm the first one who rails and, when these unexpected costs come. And, you know, and, and now it's the one. It's a cost that we're up. You know, I am the representative along with Anne of what's going on. And, and like I said, you know, like I said, oh well, I didn't know, but like. I don't want to be surprised every year with this coming up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we have an increase uh, of enrollment of kids that use MBIT, uh, but you know, it's still a surprise. And like I said, when it's a quarter of a million dollars, that's a quarter of a million dollars that you know. I think I can answer that. Really, is that. When MBIT accepts, well, Council Rock has a big change in its population. You have monthly changes, I assume, as well. But we're talking about 10,000 students. When there's a change at MBIT, you have, you're starting off with a much smaller population. The other thing is, MBIT, I'm assuming, you can answer this one, I'm assuming they don't have quotas for each school district, that every student that applies is looked at based on their individual merit. So they're not saying, oh, we're only accepting 10 students from Council Rock and, uh, and only five from you know, another district. So that if they're accepting based on individual merit, then the chips will fall where they may, and there may be that many more from Council Rock that will be accepted. So the, the, being able to budget is <laughs> impossible. Didn't they to, also to, it's impossible to budget more carefully. Haven't they also had like three different business managers in the last? Uh, three we've years? we've had some yeah. There's been some issues of which you know I've tried to uh, as much as I can disclose, made the board aware of, uh, and that was one of them. We we've our business department has gone through major changes up there. As a matter of fact, I would say they're probably all new at this point. Less than uh, well, Dr. Cavell also is the director, and he's also been there just about two years, right? Sure. So. You've got a whole different administration that's coming through there that's balancing out what's actually occurring with MBIT. Right. But my point was like and I mentioned this before, for example, if we if there's one teacher hired at MBIT, the net result of that is a one percent increase in our budget, which sounds you know, that's a lot, you know, when you think about it, we are a small school and the numbers do. My concern was, like I said, that was just a, just a to me, a number that somehow I felt that maybe I should have been made aware of sooner or hopefully would have been made aware of sooner or somehow would have known as opposed to coming to the board in April, two months before budget's due, and saying, hey, guess what, guys? It's going to cost you $250,000 more that has to be planned for. I mean, I give you credit, Tony, for planning on it last year. You said it was covered. We were good. But, you know, me chastising myself, um, I'm not in love with the fact that every year now, or for the last two years, you know, reasons notwithstanding that our budget for the MBIT has been much higher than anyone on this board anticipated. But I, I, would, I would make the point that um, the, the way the budget is set up is, is for a steady growth or a, a, a staying, the, staying the same from year to year. We've had two, two huge years of increases, which is not 
the usual. So you know that caused a failure in the in the way that the, it caused a surprise in the way that it was budgeted. That's kind of and and with the with the fact that they had issues with with you know the, the business department. Mm -hmm. But that I, I feel like that's kind of out of the control out of your control. Um, and uh, you know we're not. It's not. It, we do pay a little bit more for because remember these are only half days. Mm -hmm. um, but we do pay a little bit more. But we do. There are less costs at the district for the same students. So it's not like it's not like you know, we send seventeen more students there. Yes, we're paying a little bit more for um, for their education at MBIT, but we're also paying less for for seventeen students at. Um, Council Rock. Can, can I ask a follow-up question? As it relates to those numbers, it, it, your your last bullet where it says the calculated education costs are regular and special ed. Yes, that's our. Cost. And MBIT is considered in that bullet is considered what? Uh, both. It depends on the student. Yes. <laughs> There are regular education okay. students at MBIT, and there are special students. Yeah, because and, and that's the other thing you need to consider. Like I believe the numbers, roughly forty-one percent of the students at MBIT have some sort of IEP. So, Stone is that? Oh, no, I was going to say what, what Tony had said, and that is, it's really cost shifting that those students were going to be somewhere, and it's actually less at MBIT. Um, as you see there at 10,000. It's not. No. But they're yeah. for half a day. But they're yeah. only half a day. Yes. yes. So it's it's oh. half of 15, Fine. eight yeah. plus the 10, you know, or mm. half, you know, so roughly. I mean, I'd be proud that you have that many students that are being accepted there. It's a good thing. <laughs> Miss Pally? I mean, it's, it's really the same point. So, it looks like Council Rock is more expensive per average student than MBIT, but it's not real because the MBIT student spends half a day there and the other half in Council Rock. Yeah. So you can't really even cut it in half and say, mm -hmm. so it's a very different calculation. Um, I mean, someone to try to figure out what is the cost of the MBIT student that goes to Council Rock I mean, who is that goes to like our school the, the other half day? But I think that would be a very complicated mm -hmm. calculation to figure that out. But um, I mean, yeah, because again, these are average costs. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, it's also very interesting to see the huge difference between uh, the special ed cost. Yeah. And the non like the regular student cost is wow, like thirty thirty thousand dollars difference. Yeah. And you said this does not include grant money. Was any no, no, there's funding. there's state funding involved in, in the calculation of their budget, but that's you know, and they get a percentage based on each school district or whatever. We don't pay any of that. Um, they get that directly from the state, and it doesn't come off of anything that we get. But that's calculated in their budget as well. But I don't show that here. They say what portion of that state funding is Council Rock students, but I don't show that here. Thank you, Ms. Khan. I think it's. I mean, first of all, I think that having students that are more interested and engaged in the education, whether it's MBIT or here at Council Rock, it, it's great. I just wanted, as we're discussing this, and I, you know, I. We don't really have a choice in terms of budget that you know we're talking about less than 200 students for MBIT you know I hear comments um, being made by other board members that we're talking about full day kindergarten and not everyone has a full day kindergarten student not everyone has a special ed student not everyone ever has an MBIT, MBIT student or even students in the district but it again we're here as Council Rock School Board administration and school board directors that we're doing all of this for the benefit of every student in Council Rock and for our community, whether or not you have a child or a grandchild or a neighbor, I mean, it's, it's the community. And great schools make great communities. Thank you. Okay. 
I think that's it. Okay. Uh, next item is to approve uh, additional licenses for SMORE. Uh, it, this is a software that is used throughout the district. It's very popular for creating newsletters. The newsletter that we send out every Friday is created on this software. Um, it's used teachers and administrators have their own newsletters that they do on here. Um, the current product that we have allows up to 500 users. Um, we're adding, we've been having some extra users because we exceeded that 500 because there's so, so, such use of this program. So we've had some extra licenses. We're basically paying for those licenses and through the term of the contract, the current contract with that, which ends in August. So um, we're, we're asking for an additional 1,312 for some more licenses to renew again. At which and until the end of 24. So we're we're basically paying for some extra licenses that they're giving us to get us through the rest of this year. Mr. Tate? I mean, it, it's very easy to use and effective and very inexpensive. Ms. Khan, is there a reason that the contract wasn't, is it just because we went beyond the 500 yes. users? Is that typical? Have we run across that in? Previous years, or is it just kind of? It's, it's becoming more popular, I believe. So then, maybe for the following year, we're budgeting so it's. Yeah, we'll or is there like the next package or bundle that's above 500 or? Yeah. Okay. So we budgeted for the district license next year. Okay, great. That's awesome. Thank yep. you, Mr. Roosevelt. Just curious, what is the cost for the 500 licenses, or in other words, what's the? What's the whole cost? I understand the thirteen. I don't. Thirteen hundred dollars is for the one above five hundred. But what is yeah. like the base that we're into? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. And get, we can get we can get you that information. I still have it. Yeah. I, I was just curious. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I don't want to tell you a wrong number. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the. JAMF Pro license. This is a uh, software for supporting all of our Apple devices in, in the uh, district. Um, it, it, it allows them, it, we, we track our, soft, our devices on this and it allows them to remotely pay, repair any district owned iOS device. Um, the term is 31524 to 31525. The total cost is 12330 uh, The contract that's ending's cost was. Um, 12,230, and we have about 1,350 devices in the district that use this software, or that uh, iOS devices that we're using that are on this software. Is that right? That's good. Uh, approve ad limit <laughs> license. This is a, a security and cloud storage software that we're looking at, uh, to add. For 1924 to 4 um, it's uh, 87,658, which is above the bid threshold. However, it is being purchased through the cooperative Omnia, which allows us to, to make a purchase without um, going out to bid. So this is why it, 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 it's, it's, we haven't gone out to bid on it. Um, and it is, and Matt can elaborate more if he wants to. On well, the original cost. Uh, it was 130,000. So going through the cooperative purchase, we will get down. Excuse me, at 650. And if anyone wants to know what it does, I'd be happy to talk to you offline. And do you do we renew that every year? So this will be the first year that we're using it. Oh. Um, if it works as well, we tried. We trialed it for 90 days, and we were very happy with the results. So. Um, we're going to go for a year, and at the end of the year, if it does what we expect it to do, we'll continue. What are you using? I'd be happy to talk to you about that after. Is this replacing something else then? No. So this. Can we talk to you offline? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we'll hold our questions off until Thank after. You. I think this follows the same reason we yeah, don't talk about. Yeah, this is the safety and security, security thing. Okay. Need to know. Graduation videography services. Uh, last month you approved mm -hmm. rejecting the bids on this. This month we went out to RFP again. Uh, for a three year term, we received two proposals. 
one for uh, 30,400 a year from Omega Media Productions, uh, three year total of 91,200, and then Video Gems, uh, three year total of 46,350, or 15,450 a year. Uh, we're recommending that you select Video Gems uh, for the contract. Um, our Video Gems has done work for us before. And for about the last 12 years. For about the last 12 years. So you know, he lives in Holland. Bit of a low bidder. He loves doing this job because the commute's really easy for him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, any questions? Okay. Um, approved access CR South proposal. I'll just show you the cost and we'll leave it at that. Um, Approved tutoring contracts. So these are uh, two contracts to provide tutoring services to students um, in, in the district. Uh, one is through reading aloud from 41. They're both under the same term of the contract. It is just for from now until the end of the school year. Um, these are related to specific things. So, and so we. Uh, that's why it's, it's a short term. Um, it's a reading aloud cost is $135 per session for one student, $145 uh, for two students per, per session. Per session. It should be per session. I'm sorry, not, not per student. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> per session. And then uh, Leslie Congdon is um, $100 per session. Um, so these these are meeting a, a need. In the district, um, which is did that? something come up recently? Because they start like April first until the end. Yes. Of, yeah. Yes. It's, so we discovered specific needs that we cannot satisfy in house, and we have to go out. Yes. Okay. Let's go. Can I ask how? What is a session? Normally, is that an, an hour? Like a period, uh, an, an hour, you know, whatever, like a, a class period. Okay. I, I can't, we can't get into more about what's going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do the company. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, last, I think this is the last. Yeah. Uh, uh, approved craft agreements for pianos. So. Um, they're donating uh, $90,000 to pay for half the cost of the two Steinway pianos that we've already purchased. Um, one is the, one in each high school. Uh, they're asking that it be split, that 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 they're they're buying half a piano for each high school. That's the way they like it to be recognized. Um, the payments are to be made over seven years. Their uh, first payment will be made in April of 2024. And the final payment will be made in April of 2030. Um, we're going to ask you to approve a promissory note with, with PrEP, outlining the, the payments that they promised to make, and an agreement uh, with PrEP concerning the piano. Um, basically, you know, that we're, we'll let them know what we're using the pianos for. Um, you know, we'll, like, we'll, we'll give them uh, an accounting, not an accounting, but uh, information every year to say, you know, these are all the. Summary, summary of all the events that uh, the pianos were used in, all the public events that the pianos were used in, and um, uh, you know we promise we won't use the money for anything else, which is already too late for that. <laughs> uh, so since we already bought the pianos, so I'm going to ask you to approve that. And and just as an aside, the um, the, the prep will be there on at, at that meeting. And we did receive our first of seven payments from CREF. Awesome. Any questions? Mr. Tate? And, and I believe CREF is going to endeavor to pay it off sooner than seven years, if possible. That's so we're going to do a little, a little recognition song and dance. <laughs> <laughs> That would be highly appropriate. I don't know who's going to do the dancing. Uh, no, Pian. Pian. Um, we're going to do a little something on the 18th. Uh, I don't want to give away the surprise, but Council Rock enjoys a special 
uh, status nationally as part of the very few schools that have this kind of program. Okay. Uh, anything else? Any other questions, comments? There's no public comment, so. <laughs> Upcoming agenda item, further budget information, uh, additional budget meetings, and full day kindergarten discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Bravo. And Matt squared. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs>